morning, Christ community. This is our Sunday morning worship. It's time to give God the praise. He's worthy of the praise. I'm Pastor Autry. This is Christ Community. And this is how we worship together. Look, I got my coffee. I got my praise ready. My God is good. Come on and let's lift him up together. It is wonderful to connect with the family of faith at Christ Community. Good morning to all of you. And I am so excited today. God has a great service planned for us today. This is gonna be a great God move and I am pumped and excited about it. Before we jump into our worship and our word today, would you go ahead and just greet somebody today? Say hello to somebody, share some love, share that spirit of God even though we're in different places, we are still the body of Christ. So go ahead and do that in your browser. Go ahead and do that on Facebook Live, YouTube. Uh, share some love with someone. Let them know you miss them. I surely miss each and every one of you. And I can't wait for the time that we'll come back together. Uh, if you're on YouTube, hit that subscribe button for us. We want to get that subscriptions, those subscriptions up, as well as on Facebook. If you'd hit that like and you'd set that reminder uh, that helps us to get that message out. And would you share this with somebody? This is a wonderful opportunity for evangelism. And we're able to reach many more people now virtually than we have in the past. And it's because of you and the great church you are. And so do that for us as we continue with ministry. Want to thank each and every one of you uh, for all the prayers, the texts, the emails and the support. As I went through my recent eye surgery, uh, the surgery so far has been a great success. I am still recovering. Uh, so I just want to thank each and every one of you. And I, I solicit your prayers. And I know the Lord is watching over me. And, and I, I thank you so much that I'm part of a church that cares for me the way you do. Today, I'm not going to preach, but we got a great preacher uh, here today, Reverend Lisa Autry, you know she can bring it, y'all. And she's got a great word prepared for us. And I know God's going to move in a very, very powerful way. But before we bring uh, Lisa up, before we do our worship and all that, I do need to say a word to you, just a few minutes, about the recent events that transpired uh, in Minneapolis with George Floyd. Um, I don't know if there's ever been a time in which I was so kicked in the gut based on what I saw that that brother George Floyd experienced when he lost his life. One of my pastor friends may have described it better than I could have possibly described it. He called it a modern day lynching. And I've never witnessed a lynching, but I think on Monday, May 25th, I saw one for the first time. And if it affected you the way it affected me, maybe that's why it affected us so deeply. And it speaks to the fact that we still deal with a, an alarming reality in our culture, racism. The pandemic COVID virus is real, but racism is a real virus that continues to afflict and affect our society. And I believe as Christians, we have a responsibility to be a part of God's kingdom program. Well, we pray when we pray the Lord's prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It speaks to heaven's desire that God wants to see righteousness and justice in our culture. You can put here Psalm 89 verse 16, where the psalmist said righteousness and justice are your throne. And if that's the foundation of God's throne, surely that ought to be the foundation of the world and the foundation of America, a country that claims so many Christians that ought to be the standard bearer for the world. So I want to encourage you, number one, that God is still on the throne. God hears our hearts. He understands the grief. Surely this is a time of lament. It is a time of grieving. And for me, it's even a time of anger. But we have to redirect that energy, that anger, that grief into the proper channels. So number one, I hope we would always remember that God is still on the throne. Number two, I hope more than anything, we would redouble our efforts to be a part of the movement of justice as Christians in this country. We need to do it not just on the national level, but at the state level, 
and at the local level. Because make no mistake, what happened in Minneapolis, don't think that it can't happen in your town. It can't happen here in Dallas. And so we have to work with our local officials to ensure what happened in Minneapolis will not happen here in Dallas. And then number three, I want to encourage you to keep the faith that is in difficult times like these. And I found it difficult even for myself that I have to cry out and be thankful to my God and to believe that one day true justice will come and we will experience the kingdom in all its fullness. Let's be in prayer together, but let's do the right thing. Let's be active with our faith as we bring about what is foundation to heaven into this world. God bless you and may God keep you. It is time for giving and I want to encourage you on your screen. There are many ways to give, to continue with your giving. You've been absolutely wonderful. You've enabled us to continue to do the ministry that we're doing serving so many families, and we've been able even to affect uh, those in the healthcare field, all because of your giving. Thank you so much. We surely want to continue with great ministry. Also, I want to challenge you uh, to check your email, check Facebook page, our Facebook page live, Christ Community Richardson on Facebook, as I will be sharing a video about our plans for reopening in the future. It's a very difficult process, but I do want to share that with you in a separate video. So look for that very soon as we'll be sharing uh, what the leadership of Christ community is planning for that time when we'll come back together with the reopening. Well, I've talked enough. We've, we've, we've shared, we've fellowship. It's time to lift God up and give him the praise. That's what we came here for. And we've got great praise prepared and we've got a great word that will follow. I'm just pumped today for what God's going to do. He's been doing some great things, church, and he's going to continue it today with our worship, with our praise and the word that shall follow. God bless you. Let's give God the praise. He's worthy. Not only for who you are, God, for all that you do, all that you have done, all that you're doing now and all that you will do, Lord, we give you our worship. Please receive it, Lord. You, Lord, you are worthy. And no one can worship you for me. For all the things you've done for me. And no one can worship you for me. Here's my worship, all of my worship. Receive my worship, all of my worship. Here's my worship. All of my, my, my worship, receive my worship, all of my worship. My worship is my worship. All of my, all of my worship. Receive my, receive my worship. All of my, all of my worship. Here it is. It's my worship. All of my, all of my worship. Receive my.
God. Good morning, Christ community. It is so good to see you here on this bright Sunday morning. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to share with you. You've just heard from our phenomenal praise team and from our phenomenal pastor. And again, it's a privilege and honor for me to be here. I'm going to open up with a brief word of prayer and then we will jump into our text. Father God, we thank you so much for this time together. We thank you, Lord, for all that you continue to do in our life. We praise you, we honor you, we magnify you. You are God alone, you are king, and Lord, we just bow down and worship you. We thank you for salvation, we thank you, Lord, for grace. We thank you for this opportunity to come together surrounding your word and worship. Bless every person, Lord, uh, within the sound of my voice who's looking online. Um, we just pray, Lord, that you would continue to keep your hand of blessing on them. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name, amen. Look, I'm actually going to read my text and then jump into the sermon title. And the text is really easy to read because it is one scripture. It actually is my favorite scripture. Uh, and that's hard to say favorite scripture, but it is uh, probably a tagline for my life. But I can tell you, even as I was studying this week, uh, I saw things that I hadn't seen before, which always does happen with the Word of God. And so the scripture comes from the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 10. And it says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And so uh, I do need to tell you, this has been a tough week. Uh, it's been a tough week uh, for my family even right now, and I'll share a bit more about that later. Uh, but it's been a tough week for all of us. Uh, COVID cases continue to ramp up. Uh, it's a <clears throat> terrible mark that we're even keeping track of it, but we passed the 100,000 individuals who have uh, been diagnosed with COVID who have passed away. Uh, and of course, that's just in the United States, uh, far more than that worldwide. And of course, there have been people who have passed away outside of COVID. The economy has fallen off a cliff. There's, I think, last count, there are now over 40 million individuals, including many of you, who have filed for unemployment just since mid-March. Uh, People are in food lines, um, all, all of this, which uh, you know as well as I do. And then this week, we saw George Floyd lose his life, uh, get murdered on national and probably by now international TV uh, with a knee on his neck. 
and we were already reeling from Ahmad Aubrey. We were already reeling from Brianna Taylor. We were already reeling from, and we can go on and on and on and on. Uh, these are the things that are going on right now. And as I read this text and I look at this text, I am going to use as a subject from which to preach in the middle of all that's going on. My subject is getting to the good life. Getting to the good life. Now as we come to the text, uh, we need to realize that it's coming from the Apostle Paul. He is writing, I said it's from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. It's the letter to the church at Ephesus. And Paul is writing, now I'll tell you something about Ephesus. Ephesus is a, was a major metropolis city, uh, New York City, D.C., uh, name the big cities were Chicago, Seattle, Dallas, any number of these cities around, the, around our country. That's what Ephesus, Ephesus was. And so it was big time. Uh, it had a big booming business. In fact, in the Roman uh, Empire at that time, Ephesus was the capital of Asia. So the church was planted there, but there were already a lot of religions, a lot of competing religions, and not only competing religions, religions that uh, were more numerous than uh, Christianity. The church was still relatively new. Uh, the Temple of Diana, which was a huge deal, was there. And can you imagine this, where uh, religious people were in it for money, power, fame, and were hooked up with the political system? I know you all have a hard time imagining that, but that's what was going on in Ephesus. And there was the church where Paul actually had lived and ministered for three years. But the funny thing about it is, and it's not that funny, Paul was actually writing from Rome, and he wasn't on vacation in Rome. Paul was in prison when he was writing. So he's in prison writing to Christians in the middle of a corrupt economy, in the middle of a corrupt government, in the middle of a corrupt business world, and he's writing them these words. And I think we can relate to that. And Paul has something to say to us all. So I'm actually going to give three points and to talk about how do we get to this good life. And it's right here in the text. So first of all, we get to the good life by recognizing God's workmanship recognizing God's workmanship. So if you look at what does the text say, Paul writes to the church, we are his workmanship. Now that word doesn't mean, may not mean a whole lot to us. We go, okay, workmanship, what is that kind of arts and crafts? No, that's not what it is. Workmanship, actually the word, it might be better translated in English even as masterpieces. He's writing to the church, he's writing to the individuals, and he's saying, Paul from his prison cell, Paul writing a word of encouragement, saying, you are, in fact, we are his masterpieces. Who is his? God. He's talking about God. And, in, and I don't speak Greek, but the New Testament was originally written in Greek. And the word, the Greek word is Poema, and I don't say that to try to show it off, and I probably mispronounced it, but I'm only saying it because you might hear the word that is in there. Poema, poem. We get, it's the same root as poem. So Paul is writing, and he's saying, how do we get to the good life? Recognize that we are God's workmanship. We are God's poems. Now, we love poetry. I love poetry. I, my favorite poet is by far Maya Angelou. And there's a brilliance to any good poet. They write these poems and they capture what's going on. Maya wrote, a, one of my favorite is Still I Rise. And she wrote from the standpoint of talking about African Americans in particular coming out of the backdrop of slavery, coming out of the backdrop of Jim Crowism. And she says, out of the huts of history's shame, I rise into, out from a past that's rooted in pain, I rise. A black ocean leaping and wide, welling and swelling and bearing in the tide. 
leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise into a daybreak miraculously clear, I rise, bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave. I am the hope and the dream of the slave, and so. I rise, I rise, I rise. Now that's some good poetry. But I think, no, I know, even Maya, because I believe she's standing in the presence of the Lord right now. She is a strong Christian. I believe Maya would tell you that her whole collection of poems would never compare to God's collection, God's masterpieces. So what does that mean? What does that, Lisa, have to do with getting to the good life? I'm glad you asked. Part of getting to the good life is knowing that we are God's masterpieces. What does that mean? So behind this mirror, I, excuse me, behind this pillow, I have mirror. So this is what we do. We basically look at ourselves. Um, women may do this more than men. I think, uh, and I, I, hope, I hope I'm not stereotyping, men have a habit of kind of going in going, yeah, I look good. Now women, we kill ourselves. I'm looking, okay, my eyebrows are this and my lips are that and okay, why am I so light? Well, okay, why am I so dark? Okay, is that gray? And that is gray. Is that gray over there? And why did I, okay, and okay, am I gaining weight and is that a pimp? We do a whole lot of looking at ourselves and part of a huge component of getting to the good life is recognizing that we are his masterpieces. We are his workmanship. And in fact, Paul starts the letter in chapter one. We're in chapter two, verse 10. He starts the letter in chapter one by saying, uh, talking about that we're chosen. And if we look down at the scripture, he says, uh, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. Just as he, who is he? The Lord God Almighty, just as he chose us in him before, in Christ, before the foundation of the world. So what does that mean? While I'm looking at a pimple that may be coming up here or this or that or I don't do this or I'm too tall or I'm a failure or this person left me or this person fired me or I can't get a job or I just got out of prison and they won't give me a second chance even though I put it behind me. All of these things, this person didn't want me, that person doesn't want me, this person can't stand me, my mother didn't like me, my father hated me, I never knew my father. All of those things and so much more that we bring about, God says, I chose you. I chose you before the foundation of the world. They may not have wanted you, but I chose you. Or here's one better, they may want you, but I did do one better. I chose you and I made them. So the fact that God Almighty is the one that chose us gives us definition. It gives us a perspective. We're going to believe what he says. We should, as Christians, believe what he says, not what other people say. And quite honestly, just as important, not what we say about ourselves, the self-talk we give to about ourselves the way we talk about ourselves um, every single day for some of us. That's not what God would have for us. So Paul says we are his workmanship, but there's another aspect to it. And these days it's probably, a, a, it's a deeper aspect in some ways. He says we are his workmanship, we. So. While it's not just about Terrence Autry is God's workmanship or Lisa Autry is God's workmanship or Paul the apostle was God's workmanship or is God's workmanship in heaven, we, every single one of us, and just like any major poet, they would not have the same poem over and over and over again as brilliant as those poems may be 
Each poem is unique. Each poem co contributes to the whole collection. And where am I going with that? Here's what's most important. There's a humanity in every single one of us. Now, in Christ means Christians, but every human being, every person has been created by God. Genesis 1.27 says, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. In the image of God, every single one of us is an image bearer. What does that mean? When we go back and we look at George Floyd, what happened there? There is a police officer and police officers who lost sight of the fact that this is a human being. And when we talk about getting to the good life, we as the church, yes, we stand up. We do not internalize what we say about ourselves to the negative. Yeah, we can be honest. Yeah, I need to work on this. But we don't have to internalize things that are negative and untrue. We don't internalize what other people say about us. But we also are called to see the humanity in every single person. And what is going on, I can't say, and I won't say that it's never gone on before, but there is a resurgence that is going on right now where it is, let's just talk about anybody in disparaging ways, and yes, it's coming from the top, it's coming from the government, and you know who, but it's not just him because he couldn't do it unless it was done in an environment where people embraced it. And so we as the church are called to say, we are not going to be a part of that. And I have to say this, even when people are at en en are our enemies, and I was going to say at enmity against us, even when we have enemies, we are called to see their humanity. Why? I explain that when someone is cruel or acts like a bully, you don't stoop to their level. No, our motto is, when they go low, we go high. And we go higher than that as the Church of Jesus Christ. And if we start getting callous, if we start losing sight of people's humanity, then we have no right as the church to go to God crying about it if we, don't, if we lose sight of their humanity because then we can't tell God, well, they've lost sight of our humanity. We've lost, we've lost the right to say that. What's going on right now, children in cages, the things that are going on, the way we label each other, the church is called to see people's humanity. Yeah, we mess up, and believe me, yes, every single one of them should be brought to justice. They should. I am not minimizing that God is a God of justice, and we are called to speak out on it. But what is happening is when people disparage and they, they walk on our humanity, then yeah, you can stick a knee on somebody. You wouldn't even do that to a dog. But the humanity that is missing is what is missing in this world. And we as the church are called to speak out on that. And speaking of my evangelical brothers and sisters, the silence is deafening. The silence is deafening. And I'm going to say what my husband says, so put it on him if you don't like it. You can call him Terrence Autry. Uh, the silence is deafening. You cannot say that you are pro-life. You cannot say that you are pro-life and not see something wrong with what happened. You're pre, maybe pre-birth, but not pro-life. Because what is happening right now in our country, we are getting deadened to seeing things. It started with Rodney King, where you could see someone right before your own eyes, but over and over, now someone can get killed in Botham Johns, can get killed in his own apartment. That way we had a church member whose niece was killed in her house, but that's not good enough. We can, and this whole view there is resisting arrest, that we can watch a man, a man, an African-American man beg for his life, with a knee on him, 
And you would still think that's resisting arrest to the point where he went unconscious and may have died right in front of us. There's a problem with that. So we, the church, are called, when, where is the good in the world? Getting to the good life is recognizing, I am going to value my own humanity. That's why people do have to be brought to justice, because to do less means we don't value ourselves, and we value ourselves. But we are going to value other people. We value people even when we don't share the same beliefs. Because that's what God has called us to do. So getting to the good life is recognizing God's workmanship. I recognize it in myself. I recognize it in other people. Number two, it is recommitting to God's work. Recommitting to God's work. What did Paul say? We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now, good works is a funny term. When we hear work, you know, some of us kind of get a shiver. It's like work, okay. And, and unfortunately, work has take, gotten a bad rap. Uh, the word work was never supposed to be a bad thing in and of itself. And one of the many reasons we know that is the first thing, even before sin came into the world, when God placed Adam and Eve in the garden, he put them to work. So work is a good thing, especially, but it needs to be a good work. Well, what's a good work? You ask great questions. I'm glad you asked me. So there's a number of things that make a good work. So one of the things that make a good work is, and it's a cliche, but it's a true cliche, you were born to do it. You were born to do it. Now, what does that mean? Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We already talked about the fact that we're a chosen race, that we're chosen, excuse me, before the foundation, and we are a chosen race, that we're chosen before the foundation of the world. But now God is saying he also created these works for us before the foundation of the world. So you were literally born to do it. So what does that mean? A lot of us think, well, I'm here and now I'm going to work. Work comes out of me. But actually, the fact of the matter is the work precedes us. So we were born. The work actually births us. So, for example, I have something else behind the pillow. Um, so this is my lipstick. So if I have, this is my lipstick, this is my color. That's my lipstick, right? I don't, um, whoever created this lipstick, um, shout out to Mary Kay, whoever created this lipstick, um, the person who created it, Mary, didn't create this and go, I wonder what I'm gonna do with this. Obviously not. It was created by the creator for a purpose. So what is created serves a purpose. If Mary Kay knows that, God Almighty sure knew it before her. So when the works that were formed before the foundation of the world that God had for us, he created those works so we could walk them out. So we were created to do the unique work. So first of all, you were born to do it. Secondly, good works means God says it's good. And that's a key. So we get, we t I already talked about the unemployment rate, and again, many of us are very well, I don't, you didn't need to hear me tell you about the unemployment rate. But isn't it a funny thing? There's something called underemployment. So underemployment is where you're trying really hard, you've gotten some, whatever skills you have, it doesn't have to be school, it doesn't have to be, you don't have to have a single degree. You might have umpteen degrees, it doesn't matter. But you're trained to do something, you're interested in doing something, and you're working at a level that is not what you trained to do, and or you're not getting paid, or you might not get the time, you might only be part time. However you do, however you look at it, you're underemployed, and people in the workforce don't want to be underemployed. They want to be in fully employed to be able to use their skills. But here's the problem in the church. The church of Jesus Christ is filled with people who don't mind being underemployed when it comes to their own work. We voluntarily are un underemployed. Now, what do you mean by that? It means we have these works created in Christ Jesus, 
created for good works, which God, good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So we have these works. No, God created these works before the foundation of the world. And when it was time for our work to come up, then God said, it's time for Lisa to come up because here's her work. So Lisa needs to be there with her works. But if Lisa's not interested in what God has for her to do, I'm going to go do some other work. And I might call it a good work. I might say, you know what, this work is really good. I'm really impressed with the work that I'm doing. And you know what the church does? We'll even ask God to bless our work. Lord, would you bless me in my work? And God's going, maybe, yeah, I don't know what God says to you, but I know what he says to me. He's like, uh, the work for you is over here. So things that I think I'm supposed to be doing at a certain time, God says over here. Good is a funny term, not funny, but it's an interesting term. In the Bible, I used to get really, um, really kind of upset with calling God good because I thought he's so much better than good. And in fact, there's a song, he's better than good. Uh, so we say God is good. It's like, well, I was kind of saying God is just kind of okay. He's good. But that's our interpretation of good. The issue is this. God is the one who defines what good is. So even when we go back to Genesis, he says it is good, it is good, it is good. And of course, when he made his masterpieces, he said it is very good. So God is the one who says what's good. And the good work is the one that God declares is good, not the one that we ourselves declare to be good. And then lastly, a good work is one that gives God glory. Jesus himself said, uh, let your light so shine before men, that, uh, let, before others, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Shine before men, women, boys, girls. Let your light so shine that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. That's a big deal because even when we're doing good works, the issue is who gets the glory? Who gets the credit? So if I'm out there letting everyone know, here's what I did, here's what I'm doing, you know, did you notice me? This is me. You know, all of those things that we all fall into doing, the good work is God gets the glory, not only just like praise you, God, you got the glory. It's for real glory where you go, God, unless you moved in, I couldn't have done this. You are the one who set up the work. You are the one who set me up. You are the one who chose me. You are the one who gets the glory for real. You get the credit. Why? that other people may see these good works and give glory to our Father who's in heaven so they may come to know him. So we all who do know him can worship him. And here's the deal. I don't care. I talked about whether you have a degree or not, whether you've been left out, whether you didn't get the education, when you ha whether if you had a great education, it doesn't matter from this standpoint. You never can be fired from your good work. I don't care how old you are. I don't care if you think, it, I don't, I'm, got, I'm not going to name an age because I'll get in trouble. But it doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter what's behind you. The good work always, always is looking, the good worker, the good hirer is always looking for people who want to serve in his field. Jesus talked about that. So God is calling us all to good works. Good works also involves serving somebody. So the question is, who are we serving? So finally, what is, how do we go about this good life? We, go, we look knowing, recognizing that we're God's, uh, recognizing God's workmanship, recommitting to God's work, and then rejoicing in God's grace, rejoicing in God's grace. In the middle of all that we're going through, and I am not one, I promise you, uh, I am not one who tells people, oh, you ought not mourn, oh, you're too blessed to be distressed. You, we can be distressed. 
Jesus was distressed in the garden, and he knew he was getting up in three days. So don't tell me we're not allowed to be distressed. And Jesus was perfect without sin. So he tells us that's a real emotion. We have a full range of emotions. I am saying, however, that's not the only story. And so the bigger perspective, the biggest perspective in the middle of what we are going through, in the middle of the downturn, how can we, how do we find, how do we access this good life? It's rejoicing in God's grace, grace, unmerited favor. Paul says this, he says, uh, for by grace you have been, right in uh, 289, in fact, I'm gonna read, I'm gonna read this before then. Um, and he says, he says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, not that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not as a result of works that no one should boast. And the one I was looking for in chapter one, verse six, Paul, this is an excerpt from, um, an excerpt from a previous sentence, and, and Paul says, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved, in him, the beloved is Jesus Christ. He's talking to the church and he says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us. He lavished on us. And then you get to the scripture I read immediately preceding Ephesians 2.10, where it says, for we have been saved through grace, that not of ourselves, it is a gift of, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, those works, that no one should boast. Grace. So, hear me well, and I beg you hear me well. I am not minimizing a single person who's been lost. I'm not minimizing, God grieves, we grieve and disproportionate number of people have passed away in the African American community, but in every community, we grieve. Do we ever talk about the number of people who've never gotten COVID? Do we ever talk, does that ever make the news, the number of people who have uh, been cured? Does that, ever, someone told me, I read in a book years ago, I think it was R.C. Sproul, said this, and he was writing to Christians. He said, when we get to the point when we stop asking God, why doesn't he save everybody? And we can move to the point to ask him, why does he save anybody? We will have taken a step forward in understanding grace. God doesn't have to do any of it, but he loves us and even right now, he loves us. He's lavishing it on us. Even when we are going through, my, uh, one of my closest uh, family members is going through it right now uh, and may be laying her husband to rest even as I'm speaking. And I was talking to her uh, a week ago uh, when he was placed on life support. Phenomenal man, phenomenal man, phenomenal family. But I was talking to her and she was, understandably grieving, completely unexpected, and even when it is expected, it's horrific. But she said this. She said, God is the one who gave them to me. God is the one who gave them to me, so how could I turn my back on God right now? And she is grieving, rightly so. How many of us can do that in the midst Grief on one side, yes, because that's real. But reveling and recognizing God's mighty hand on us, on the other hand. God has called us to live a life, to live a good life. It's not a life where necessarily uh, we're uh, on the beach, uh, name your, on a cruise, living in a mansion, um, as we've seen, I'm not saying God sent it, but he sure has allowed it. The world has turned upside down. And it is an amazing thing that the things we counted on as a good life, we've shown and we've learned 
that those things can disappear like that. But knowing that we're his workmanship, knowing that God has called us to good works, knowing that God's grace has been lavished upon all of us, those who know him and those who don't yet know him, he's still calling out. There's grace because he's saying, I love you so much. I want to be in relationship with you. That's the good life. That's even in the midst, even in the midst, that's the good life that God has called us to. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. God bless you, Christ community. God bless you all. What a powerful word, getting to the good life. I truly believe that's God's word for us today, and I hope and pray that God has touched your heart in a powerful way. Maybe today is the day that your good life starts. Maybe it starts by having a relationship with Jesus Christ. Maybe you've been watching for quite some time. Maybe this is your first time watching. I don't know where you are uh, in your walk with God, uh, but maybe it's time to really dive into this good life. Uh, on your screen, there's an invitational prayer. It's our opportunity to connect you to the living Christ. We serve a Christ who lives. The gospel is very simple. Christ died for our sins and rose from the dead. What does that mean? He lives and he knows you and he knows you by name and he wants you to have this good life, but he's not gonna enforce it upon you. He's, he's not gonna twist your arm. He's gonna draw you by his spirit. And that's what you're sensing right now. That's what you sensed when you heard that word preached. You know the Lord is speaking to you. And I simply want to lead you through this prayer and just ask you to trust him. And trust me, there are billions of people around the world that'll tell you that they have never regretted the day they trusted Christ. Would you trust him today? Would you trust him? The prayer's on your screen. Come on and pray it with me. I'll lead you through the prayer. And if you pray this prayer believing, he surely will save you. Father, we thank you again just for a tremendous move of your spirit. Thank you for your word. Thank you that you're a God that wants us to experience the good life. And somebody is watching right now, Lord, they don't have a relationship with you. They're not a Christian. They've been watching for quite some time. Or maybe somebody is watching for the first time today, but Lord, they have sensed your presence in a way they never have. God, would you move them to pray this prayer with me? Would you move them to trust you by faith? You don't twist arms. You don't force yourself. You simply invite us. I thank you that you're that kind of God. If that's you and you're watching and you want to trust Christ, just repeat these words after me. I thank you, Lord, that you died and rose for my sins. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for forgiveness. I accept you as my Savior and my Lord to make a difference in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, we celebrate you. If you prayed that prayer for the very first time, you've been brought into God's family. Matter of fact, the angels are throwing a party in your name, because we're celebrating you, and we wanna help you with your newfound faith and your new relationship with Jesus Christ. There's an email address on the screen, life at ccrichardson.org. Email us. Let us know what you've just done. If this is your first time trusting Christ, you, you've trusted Christ for the very first time in your life, we want to help you with it. We're not trying to embarrass you. There's some serious steps we want to help you with, and we want you, you to begin this wonderful journey with trusting Christ. Maybe you're watching today and you already know Christ, but the truth is you're not part of a local church family. If God's universal family is important, he wants you to be in the body of Christ, you understand that. How much more is his local church family? And so we'd love to take you in here at Christ Community. The email address is on your screen, life at ccrichardson.org. Would you email us? Would you do that today? Let us know you want to unite with us. We'll take you through our next steps course, and that will help you become a part of our faith family. <clears throat> if you're a guest today, there's a link right there in the description box. Uh, connect with us. If you would click on that, it takes about a minute to fill out. We don't share your information with anyone. We simply want to bless you. We have something we want to send to you. Would you fill that out just for watching? 
thank you so much. We appreciate you and all that God is doing in your life. God bless you. May God keep you. Christ community, to all of our friends and family that are watching, the good life awaits you. Let's walk in it. Let's receive the benediction. You are the light of the world. Go now knowing that the good life is available for you. Live it. Live it to the fullest. And watch God bless you richly. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. We'll see you next week.